So I'm Gunjin. I'm uh, a PhD student here at RRI, and I'm working in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. So I'll be talking about one of the greatest mysteries that surrounds us all the time, and I mean even now. So like we are being bombarded by bullets, which we call cosmic rays, like being pelted at Earth at energies greater than an exploding nuclear bomb, and so thankfully for, uh, for us, we are surrounded by Earth's atmosphere. We are protected by the Earth's atmosphere. And before I tell you how the atmosphere acts as a hero, uh, I'll just try to uh, explain what cosmic rays are. By rays, we typically think of uh, a photon or a day of light. But uh, cosmic rays are, in fact, particles, like charged particles, like protons or helium nuclei or in fact heavier nuclei, uh, carbon, silicon, iron. So coming back to the atmosphere, when this charged particle enters the Earth's atmosphere, it interacts with the molecules in the atmosphere and breaks down into smaller particles. And we call these particles as daughter particles or the secondary cosmic rays. And these secondary cosmic rays interact with more uh, in more particles in the atmosphere and create further smaller particles with even lesser energies. And this goes on, giving us, eventually giving us an extensive shower of particles just raining down on the Earth. And uh, this air shower, uh, so this is a hypothetical picture of what this air shower looks like. And this contains a lot of information. Like scientists actually use this air shower to determine the mass of that primary particle that started it, or even the energy of that particle. So how did it all start? So uh, when radioactivity was first discovered, it, uh, scientists believe that only the radiation that is coming from the radioactive element in the surface could ionize the air particles, uh, could ionize the atoms in the air. That is like stripping of the atoms in the air of their electrons. So to test this theory, Theodore Wolff in 1909 performed an experiment using electroscope. On the ground, on the ground, he of course measures the ionization uh, rate, and then he moves this electroscope to Eiffel Tower. And you would expect that when you go high up from the ground, that ionization rate decreases. But what I instead notice is that the ionization rate, uh, rate decreases, but not with a significant amount, or the amount that he had anticipated. So then, uh, so uh, in the later years, Victor Hess took it to another level. He took several hot air balloon flights with several electroscopes in the, uh, in the hot balloon, in the hot air balloon, uh, till 1912. So he took several, uh, he took it to the heights of like 50,000 kilometers in the atmosphere. And uh, the commercial planes that fly uh, is at the heights of 100,000 kilometers, just for reference. So uh, what he noticed at such height was that the ionization rate had started increasing. So uh, to rule out that these uh, ionization radiation was coming from, say, sun, he took these uh, flights even at night and uh, also during the solar eclipse, but not much difference was noticed. So he concluded that this radiation is coming from, uh, uh, is not coming from the terrestrial origin, but something, but somewhere from the extraterrestrial origin, and thus the term cosmic. And he got a Nobel Prize in 1936 for this discovery. So later, uh, si uh, later scientists followed uh, this discovery and built uh, detectors to detect this uh, radiation. So in year 1991, we actually uh, detected the first cosmic ray, highest energy cosmic ray particle with an energy of 3.2 into 10 raised to power 20 electron volts. So electron volts is the unit of energy we use for cosmic rays. And this particle was termed as oh my god particle. So uh, to give you an idea, uh, idea of how 
huge this energy is. If a ten, uh, this is the energy a tennis ball would have, it was if it was hit by all the might of a professional tennis player. So now just imagine all that energy squeezed into just one tiny atom. And a tennis ball might have, say, 10 raised to the power 20 of such atoms. And if that does not impress you, think of the Large Hadron Collider, which is like man, uh, most powerful man-made accelerator that exists on Earth. So it can accelerate particles to, own, uh, to energies up to 10 raised to the power 13 EV, which is still 10, ti uh, 10 million times smaller than the energy that this particle has. So what actually put this energy in this particle? Uh, so after this, more rigorous uh, experiments were done, several detectors were built, and extensive techniques were used to detect more of these particles to understand where are these cosmic guns and what are these cosmic guns fire, uh, firing these bullets at us. So it seems as if, since we still don't know what are these cosmic guns, it feels as if we have not, we have not progressed much. Nothing much has changed since then. But a lot has changed. We have more data than ever now. And the plot on the right shows you the flux that we have of cosmic rays now. So on y-axis, we have the flux, or say the number of these particles with respect to energy on the x-axis. Uh, so uh, mathematically, this data can be defined by a power law. And you'll notice uh, a few features here and there. And you could also think of uh, this data as a human leg with a knee and an ankle uh, signifying the features that we see in this uh, curve. So as we can see, a, mass, a vast majority of these particles lie at the, low, at the lowest energies. And these are believed to be coming from the uh, extreme events happening on or in the surface of the sun. Then as we move to higher energy, uh, we have high energy cosmic rays or uh, very high energy cosmic rays which we believe are uh, coming from the events, explosive events or high energy events happening in our own galaxy, that is Milky Way. And uh, somewhere around here, maybe the ankle or before the ankle, we expect a transition, a transition from galactic cosmic rays that are the cosmic rays that are uh, produced in our own galaxy to extragalactic cosmic rays. That are the cosmic rays produced uh, coming to us from outside our galaxy. And it is simply because uh, as we increase the energy of these particles, it becomes harder to confine them in a small space. And small space being our galaxy here. So, so uh, like I mentioned, that there are 100 of these particles just being bombarded at us. But we really need to take into account the area at, we, at which these particles are falling. So for example, at the lowest energy, the rate of these particles would be one particle per meter square per second. And as we go on, uh, as we go up in the energies, we see a lot lesser flux of these particles. So around the energies uh, that we can obtain from, uh, say, Large Hadron Collider, we expect one particle per meter square per year. And going up higher in the energies, we expect one particle per kilometer square per year. And if we think of the energies that Oh My God particle had, we expect that a uh, particle like this would, ha uh, would uh, hit Earth at the rate of one per kilometer square in a thousand years. So that like, leaves us with limited data at the highest energy. So what we do to get any information on the source? Uh, so uh, we know we have uh, two uh, two things that we can make use of at our hands. 
uh, which are the magnetic field and which exist almost everywhere. So when a particle starts from the source uh, and tries to reach to the Earth, it will interact with this magnetic field and get deflected and will lose the information from where it comes from. But at higher energies, this might just help us because at higher energies, particles are deflected lesser, than the, uh, lesser by the magnetic field and thus limiting the region from which it could come from. Uh, the other thing, the, uh, so uh, for us, the universe might just look quite from a source to Earth, but there are uh, photons that is filling the entire space in between. And these photons for a charged particle would act as a traffic or a crowded bus stand. So a particle would interact with these photons and lose energy. So if it started with energy, say 10 raised to power 21 EV, it will interact with the photons, lose its energy, and can only, and say it uh, loses its energy and we detect it at 10 raised to power 19 EV. So it sets a limit on the distance from which it can travel to us without losing much of its energy. And that tells us how far the source can be. Along with this, we cannot just uh, figure out what the source is on, the, on just relying on cosmic rays. We need more messengers that point out to the source of these particles. Since uh, the cosmic rays here, uh, shown by red, they'll deflect in the magnetic field, they will lose the information on uh, the directional of, uh, direction of the source. So we can consider neutrinos as the other messenger particle that might give us any information about the source of this particle. So uh, neutrinos are uh, chargeless particles that are produced when these cosmic rays or the hadrons that we believe them to be interact uh, with the protons or the field around the source. Uh, uh, around the source. So we expect neutrinos are produced and it can come to Earth without deflecting much and thus like acting as a smoking gun and like pointing to the source uh, from which it comes from. Another messenger that we can use uh, to fix this puzzle is gamma rays which are again uh, produced when uh, the cosmic rays interact with the particles at the source. And uh, again, since these gamma rays are also not deflected uh, by the magnetic field, we can see them, uh, we can receive them at Earth and try to constrain the area, the sources that these particles come from. So now uh, we have actually a lot of potential sources that could be producing these high energy bullets, but the puzzle is still not complete, so we need multi, like uh, several messengers, more data to solve this. So that's all. Thank you.